we now turn our attention back to water vapor in the atmosphere and we'll be talking about humidity in this lecture video and how that in turn will lead us to concepts and things uh, like precipitation and how that is caused by some of the processes we've already been talking about through prior lectures and lessons. And so to have us talking about the rain or more generally the precipitation, our song for this video is Here Comes the Rain Again by Eurythmics. So we can see this you know, fog in the background and we're talking again about how that's tied to our humidity concepts and more generally a, a precipitation as we move forward. Now also a note, I want to quickly quip from one of my favorite shows, Futurama here, in the sense that so far we've generally been talking conceptually about most of these things, We uh, and really that will be the main emphasis on things like exams as well, um, but in some of the assignments you'll be working on this week, you will be uh, forced more into uh, solving for some particular math equations, so to quip here, I'm afraid that we are going to have to use math. So it, what I really want to emphasize though before we get uh, too deep into that is in, in possibly scare some of you is simply just to note once again that as I emphasized early on in this class again I'm I want us to focus on the conceptualization uh, of these concepts you know how can you generally con understand them at a conceptual level not necessarily solving complex math equations and, and really none of these equations hopefully will be too uh, difficult for you. I mean, uh, what we'll see in this video, for example, on some algebraic uh, equations. And just to note that, again, I will be showing you examples, anything that you would see or have to solve for uh, in a lab or other assignment in this module or, will, or tied to this lesson uh, will uh, you know, be solved out in, as an example or multiple examples for you within this. So with that, we move forward. And so just um, although I guess perhaps backwards, considering this slide actually is a review, just to review uh, our different states of ice to water to water vapor. Again, remember that sensible versus latent heat, um, as we'll be talking about, you know, that being an important part here um, when we're talking about water vapor, kind of this vaporization, uh, uh, and you know that again latent versus sensible heating uh, of water and water vapor for example. So, so when we're talking about humidity um, what we're actually talking about essentially is a measure of water vapor in the air. And so there's a variety of ways or metrics to measure this in different variety of units um, but we're going to go with and use water va or vapor, um, excuse me, vapor pressure, excuse me, um, which is essentially measuring that pressure of water vapor in some defined volume of air. And so, you know, the higher the pressure, the more water vapor. I um, mean, you can think of it as these water molecules that are bouncing around with the many other gases. And um, we already talked a little about the various gases that are in the atmosphere. And we have, I did show you an earlier video a little bit of how water vapor is very dynamic within the atmosphere. Um, so just to remind ourselves of that, um, here this and what we'll be seeing is the pressure measured in what we term millibars. And so you know, we can think of this pressure as we see on the right hand side. So again, there's the vapor pressure kind of up here on the top, and, the, um, and this is those, those gas molecules that are bouncing around in the atmosphere. We can think of this liquid below being our water, and so there's actually an interaction between that gas and water. We have some phase transition going in and out, um, and generally you will have some evaporation off of that liquid if the vapor pressure um, in the atmosphere is not or is lower than the, than that of the liquid um, for any given temperature particularly so for any given temperature there is a maximum vapor pressure and we'll get to that and generally the warmer the air is the higher its maximum vp or again, vapor pressure um, the, the colder the air is, the lower its maximum vapor pressure. So, and there's two actually two separate terms here that we want to keep straight. Um, well, either this vapor pressure, or what we term saturated vapor pressure. Um, maximum vapor pressure and saturated vapor pressure are the same thing. Um, but again, that's the saturated vapor pressure or maximum pressure um, of water vapor at a given temperature. Is, is it was denoted actually by this graph here. So this black line is showing the relationship between air temperature and saturated vapor pressure. And so um, you can, if we trace this line, so you can see here on the bottom uh, from left to right, we have our temperature starting at zero degrees Celsius or our water would freeze up to about 35 degrees Celsius. Um, most of the range of temperatures we're generally gonna be seeing on uh, Earth's uh, surface and atmosphere 
um, where, where humans generally reside. And then we can see our vapor pressure on the vertical axis in millibars. And again, that uh, black line tracing the maximum vapor pressure or saturated vapor pressure. So really anything below it here could exist, as we'll get to in these coming slides. Um, and that's going to be where we have less actual vapor pressure in the air than we have um, that saturated vapor pressure that or that maximum so again we can't really have anything up above this black line because that would mean there was more vapor pressure in the air um, than is allowed by saturated um, i mean if we actually really want to get into detail there's certain cases where that could happen or does happen um, that's kind of advanced a little bit beyond what we're going to be talking about in this class but um, just to don't generally we're going to be dealing with anything below that line, as we can see in our first example here. But again, once more time, just to note, there's two factors to account for here. There's the vapor pressure, and that is the amount of water vapor in the air. And there's the saturated vapor pressure, or that is the maximum water vapor that can be held at a given temperature. So let's start with an example. An air mass at 26.5 degrees Celsius that has a water, or excuse me, a vapor pressure of 15 millibars. So we can see that uh, by the red dashed line and the red dot on now that I've placed on our graph to the right. We can see that we have our temperature here at 26.5 degrees. We trace that up. Um, and we can see that I've placed a dot here well, how, how much vapor pressure is actually measured in the air. That is that 15 millibars. Again, if we trace uh, laterally here, we would reach that 15 over here. As so we can note that the saturation vapor pressure at this temperature, again, is if we trace all the way up on our line, we can see that that here intersects at about 35 millibars. All right? So we have now determined a few things. We have our air temperature, we have our vapor pressure, and we've determined from this graph our saturation vapor pressure. And these are going to be important because this helps us determine what we term relative humidity. And this is usually what you hear if you hear about a humidity percentage being reported or you know how humid it is. This is actually usually what you're hearing um, in any sort of weather report. But this actually refers to the ratio of the amount of water vapor in the air. So again, that vapor pressure versus essentially that how much uh, it, there can be or that maximum vapor pressure. Um, so this is always going to be expressed as a percent. So to calculate it, we simply just take one divided by the other. We take that vapor pressure and divide it by that saturated vapor pressure. And so we can see that here on the bottom. I've taken that 15 millibars or that, or that actual amount of vapor pressure in the air. And now we can divide that over at 35 millibars or the maximum amount that can be held at our 26.5 degrees Celsius air. And so when we do that, we again get this is that is equal to about 0 0.43. Uh, in decimal form, or we multiply that by 100, 43% uh, for our relative humidity. So our air is at 26.5 degrees Celsius in this case, with a present vapor pressure of 15 millibars, is a little bit less than half, or you can get that 43% is a little bit half than 50% of its maximum capacity to hold, which again is 35 millibars, is what relative humidity is telling us there. Now. And if we, we now were to change this so that we actually um, have our vapor pressure now being up all the way at 35 uh, millibars, as we can see again, now that I've placed our, the red dot here, so we can have shifted our vapor pressure from 15 millibars up to 35 millibars. Again, our saturation vapor pressure is also 35 millibars. But now if we go through all that same process, calculate the relative humidity, again, 35 uh, actual amount in the air over 35 uh, um, is the maximum amount, um, then we get 1 or 100%. So again, 35 actual over 35 maximum gives us that 1 uh, or 100% if we multiply that by 100. Or, and so now we are you know, have the same amount uh, in the air as that can be held. And so when that happens, that is what we term saturations. When we have that 1 or 100% relative humidity, that is when the amount of water vapor in the air, again, that vapor pressure, is equal to the maximum amount that can be held, saturation vapor pressure. Sorry if that, the emphasis uh, is getting you know, repetitive, but I just want to make sure that we're getting that emphasis on uh, these terms and keeping them separate. So. Um, Note that, so in that example that I just showed you when walking through, there, the, you know, one way we have to reach saturation is to simply add vapor pressure until 
uh, that vapor pressure and saturation vapor pressure become equal. And so this would happen in a case, for example, uh, most often over the oceans, we have water being evaporated off of oceans or other large bodies of water by sunlight, you know, essentially incoming solar radiation or other energy um, that is, you know, warming up that water and or, you know, the, since we, the, simply the vapor pressure of the air is not equal to, um, or, you know, is, is lower than that vapor pressure uh, or that vapor or that pressure of the water um, surface, um, and we end up having evaporation off of that uh, water and uh, that vapor pressure going into the air. So that's one way we can have that vapor pressure increase uh, until it possibly reaches that saturation vapor pressure or matching with this temperature. But a second way we should note is simply if we change the temperature. So actually, you know, because we can see uh, by our table here that as we increase our temperature, that maximum vapor pressure or saturation vapor pressure increases, we can note that if we simply start decreasing our temperature, we're going to move towards, uh, or, you know, with a, um, if we start with a, a vapor pressure and just simply decrease our temperature, we then will end up moving towards that line of saturation vapor pressure, as we can see over on this example on the right. And so, for example, if we start now in with our air mass with 26.5 degrees, and we cool it then to 20 degrees Celsius, again, keeping simply that vapor pressure in the air, or that amount of uh, that vapor pressure that, that's actually in the air, the amount of water vapor that's in the air constant that we can see from here to here. We simply just trace our line again from 26.5 to 20. Now when we do our calculation, uh, as we can see down here, so again our actual amount, still 15 millibars. Uh, below it is 24 millibars now, um, because that is our new saturation vapor pressure at 20 degrees Celsius. Now we have increased our relative humidity. We're up to 0.63 or 63%. So we continue to take that along this path. Um, we can then can see if we trace it all the way over. We can see from our graph here that it appears the, that our air mass at 26.5 degrees when we started with a vapor pressure of 15 millibars, assuming none is added or taken away by some other process, then must be cooled um, simply by temperature wise to about eh, 13 degrees Celsius, we can see here, if we trace down once we reach that line, uh, to reach our saturation. And so, um, again, in weather reports, or simply if you've ever heard of this term, the dew point, um, what is that word? That is referring to is simply that temperature to which our air must be cooled to become saturated. So again, given the amount of water vapor pressure in the air, um, how much water vapor, how much vapor pressure there is, if we just simply change, decrease the temperature, how much does the temperature have to decrease um, before we reach that, rel uh, that relative humidity of 100%, or again, where our actual amount is the same as our saturation vapor pressure. Um, and so, again, when we see this dew point value, we want to note that, I mean, we're going to start seeing really big differences um, between um, our vapor pressure in the air versus our saturation vapor pressure. So, you know, if our um, vapor pressure in the air is a lot lower than our saturation vapor pressure. That means the dew point is going to have to be, uh, you know, a temperature that's quite lower than our present temperature that we're, we we might start at. But if you know we have a, a set or a vapor pressure that's almost uh, as low or excuse me, almost as high, excuse me, uh, either way, uh, as our saturation vapor pressure, you know, if those two numbers are very close to each other, then we know that the temperature doesn't have to cool very much at all before we reach that saturation point. So again, all this to say that the second way to reach our saturation in, this, in, in a way is lowering the temperature until, again, our vapor pressure and saturation vapor pressure become equal values. So just showing that out in kind of a visual here, um, you know, again, noting what our dew point is. And so noting, because really once we reach that saturation point, that is when we start to see condensation. And that is when we see things like precipitation. So, and this is also tied to, also, um, if you ever go out probably frequently in the morning, you see dew on the grass. Um, you know, when we have our precipitation events, what we see, we have occurring in this case, is if we track from left to right here, again, simply thinking from warmer temperatures on the left, to colder, temp colder temperatures on the right. What I'm showing you here is kind of this outer circle showing the possible extent of our um, 
a capacity to hold, so that outer black circle we can think of as our saturation vapor pressure, and the blue inner circle we can think of as simply that vapor pressure, how much water vapor is in the air if we kind of were to compile it all together. And so we can see, um, you're kind of going from left to right, I've just assigned kind of arbitrary values here. So we're going to have a 30% relative humidity up to 70% relative humidity as we start shrinking that capacity to hold as we cool our temperature going to the right. And then we reach that dew point here in this example, um, where now we're at our relative humidity of 100%, our saturation vapor pressure and vapor pressure are equal. And if we continue to cool past that point, and we will be employing this in some future lessons and lectures, um, but note if we continue to cool past that point, we see, we get an example of something like over here on the right, where you know, we're going to continue to keep uh, any water vapor as water vapor that remains um, within you know that circle that uh, saturation vapor pressure circle that we're continuing to decrease in size that we have here again denoted by the black. So again, everything that within this um, would continue to remain in that gaseous vapor form. Our relative humidity is going to remain at 100% because it's you know, essentially the air is going to hold on whatever it can with with that vapor pressure um, and saturation vapor pressure still remaining equal. But this kind of excess excess that we can see on the outside, you know, again that that now vapor pressure that simply can't be held any longer as water vapor is going to be that which condenses to our liquid water form, and then again is either ends up something like on Earth's surface that we see as dew, or ends up as precipitation falling from the sky, depending on the temperature. So we can see this here in visual form, right? Our simple reduction of temperature below saturation leading to condensation in terms of dew, precipitation, or uh, we see on our left hand example side here, you know, if you take a cold water bottle out oftentimes on a hot summer day, put it out outside, kind of as it gets, gets that perspiration on the outside, or that very cold uh, liquid on the inside of the bottle is, is chilling the air immediately around it um, and can cause that uh, you know, simply water vapor that is floating around in the atmosphere to cool and condense along the outside of that bottle. So we've made all of these calculations, we have some of these measurements, but you know the question is well how do we acquire these? You know um, temperature perhaps it makes sense to acquire from a thermometer, um, but I um, mean, you know, if we only know our air temperature um, is 26.5 degrees, how can we actually acquire some of these other measurements of, of vapor pressure and water vapor pressure that we've been talking about? And so the tool most commonly used to do this is known as a sling psychrometer. I have an example on the right. I'll also provide a link here. Um, the video is a little cheesy, but I'm sure you'll make it through. Um, and again, just kind of get the main or aspects of what a sling psychrometer is out of it. Um, but you know the whole idea here is that um, with this example on the right, there are two bulbs or thermometers um, within this sling psychrometer, and both bulbs start at the same air temperature, but you put water on one of those bulbs known as the wet bulb. It has a little wick on the end of it here. It's kind of hard to see in this example, but it has a wick that kind of soaks up water, soaks up moisture when you put some water on it. And simply once when you put water on that, you swing the you know, sling psychrometer around. And as the sling psychrometer is swung around for 30 seconds, a minute, or a couple minutes at most, um, essentially if that surrounding air is below saturation, then some of that water on the wet bulb should evaporate or will evaporate into the air. And this happens because, again, there's that pref pressure differential between the wet bulb and the surrounding air. Um, so in the air pressure, uh, the air, the, excuse me, the vapor, the water vapor pressure in the air, if it is less than that liquid, um, will, you will have some of that evaporation um, off of the liquid that wetted the wet bulb into the air. That cooling, uh, to remind ourselves, um, remember when we have that latent heat of evaporation, it ends up um, having that, um, when we have our evaporation, we're taking in uh, that heat and then cooling around, immediately around it, and so that's what we're getting, that cooling of that thermometer that we're going to see um, on the wet bulb, and so once we swung it around for a minute, we have a, oftentimes a difference between the dry bulb temperature again, which is still maintaining that 
air, ambient air temperature around it versus the wet bulb, which should be some temperature lower because uh, it has had water around it and that wet bulb has evaporated off to some degree and cooled that thermometer. And so essentially the, 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 the simple conceptualization of this is the more or the greater temperature difference that we end up seeing then, um, then with that we end up then seeing um, a lower relative humidity oftentimes. So, and that's what we can see from this table here. And so you'll be actually working through a little bit of example of this. But essentially with our dry bulb temperature, excuse me, dry bulb air temperature versus wet bulb temperature, um, we term this the dry bulb depend depression, excuse me, um, where our dry bulb temperature is subtracted from the wet bulb temperature. So just for an example, if you had 26.5 degrees to start, um, and afterwards you swing the swing psychrometer, if the wet bulb shows now an 18 degrees Celsius temperature, you would subtract the uh, dry bulb temperature from the wet bulb temperature, you get that wet bulb depression difference of 8.5 degrees Celsius. So then you'd go to consult this relative humidity table. We're on the horizontal axis here across the top. You have your wet bulb depression value. So we can find our 8.5 degrees Celsius here and start tracing down to match our beginning temperature or that dry bulb temperature at about 26.5 degrees that we can see here. And we, those two meet, as we can see by our arrows that I have drawn here, we get to a point that's oh, about 43% within right here. Uh, so the, or again, that tells us that we have about 43% relative humidity. And so uh, starting with that value, um, you want to actually note that we can also then back calculate and get some of those other values that we were interested in uh, and things like dew point. Because if we know our 43% um, relative humidity, and again, we know that our air started at 26.5 degrees Celsius, we then know kind of inverse, um, either using this saturation vapor pressure table or coming back to the graph that we started with, if we go to 26.5 degrees Celsius and trace up, well, again, remember that saturation vapor pressure we know was 35 millibars. And so because we know that, and we know that what our saturation vapor pressure is or that maximum that can be held, and we know the percentage or, you know, that relative humidity value, we can actually figure out how much is presently in the air if we didn't know. Um, and so we can calculate that vapor pressure or amount of water vapor pressure in the air by uh, multiplying, in this case, we can see um, by 35 on each side. So essentially cancels out our denominator here. So again, whatever our value in this case would be, you know, if it, whatever, it doesn't have to be 35 in this example, but in this case, 35 for our maximum amount. You know, 35 times 35 on this right-hand side, cancel these out. And then we multiply 35 by our 0 0.43 over here. And that means then in our algebraic equation, our X or that actual amount of uh, vapor pressure in the air ends up being 15 millibars. So we're right back to where we started uh, with our beginning example. So again, we might change up the values here that you'll be working with, but you know, hopefully you can follow these steps through with uh, these calculations. So um, even from that, once again, we can uh, then go to find our dew point because once we know our vapor pressure is 15 millibars, we know, well, we simply can trace over uh, Vertic, or excuse me, uh, horizontally until we meet our saturation vapor pressure line for our present uh, vapor pressure that's within the air. And so we trace over until we hit our line, trace down. Once again, our dew point uh, is 13 degrees Celsius. Because really what we're saying here is, again, given the amount of water vapor that's in the air, 15 millibars in this example, to at you know, for dew point, what air temperature must we cool to to reach that saturation vapor pressure. So once again, you'll be seeing some of this in lab four. Um, normally in an in-person class, we would have you actually out collecting measurements with the sling psychrometers, but of course we don't really have that uh, ability to do so for our online class. So you'll be provided with some measurements or I'll be having you consult maps for some uh, average uh, measurements. And we'll see that one of those example type of maps and another slide or two. But again, you'll be calculating some of these, um, going through some of these calculations that we just walked through. Um, and just to note some other things that are valuable to know here, 
you know, really when we're talking about what we perceive as being humid or not, that generally is more related to our relative humidity. And um, to note that some of the examples that I'll be walking you through and kind of wanting you to work and conceptualize around, what I'm curious is, you know, why, given um, some of these measurements that you'll be provided or measure that you'll be doing the measuring for, why are they average for their condition or you know, the seasons that they will be representative for? And so I want you to think of things like the seasonal high and low pressure systems, and you'll be also be supposed to be covering some of this through coming lessons as well that are relevant. And to think of the high and low uh, broad circulation patterns that we've looked at um, a little bit and referencing back to that. So example, um, you know, so just to note, um, you know, as I said in the last slide, you know, you could, might be using you, uh, having you consult some maps because again, really all we've been talking through here is really the physics of how our water vapor and you know the vapor pressure in the atmosphere you know, is condensing or evaporating. But we actually want to bring a little bit of geography to that, where that varies over space, why that's important. Um, and so we can see through with our map here, again, our saturation vapor pressure, or in this case, um, our annual relative humidity um, measured in our relative humidity here varies um, over space. And again, this also is um, going to be important because our, our vapor pressure is dependent on the source area of where those air masses come from in part tied to that last slide and map. So we have a series of different air masses um, that are each given a name and by two letters, as you can see by the right here. So these denote relative moisture and temperature characteristics. So for example, we have our MT or maritime tropical air, you know, maritime being over you know, water, um, for in tropical being very warm, uh, coming from more equatorial or tropical regions. Um, maritime polar air, in contrast, again, while well, maritime still over water, polar, of course, uh, much colder air, coming much more up from the polar, air, polar areas. Um, kind of similar with CT and CP are, are continental tropical or continental polar. Continental, in this case, meaning it is generally drier air and because it's coming um, or originating from our land masses, not over our oceans. And so why, we'll see why the, all this is important as we continue to move forward in some lessons and talking about things like clouds, uh, lifting mechanisms, the jet stream, and talking about severe weather.